And, and so when you're a new leader, you talked about the respect. And I think that a lot of young leaders, to your point, they know that they want to get respect, but then they end up giving away their power, which ironically takes away their respect influence. Would, what are your thoughts on that? Would you agree? It's especially in a organization that's built around leadership, right? That's a hierarchical organization. People expect to be led. A, a senior member, a senior employee that, that, um, that wants to be respected, doesn't want to be, doesn't want you to say, do what you want to do. You're the senior guy. You must know them. They expect to be led. They want to be led competently, but then. It's about learning what makes that individual unique. What do they excel at? And does, do they know that, that they excel at that? And doing this in a way that isn't, you're not pandering to them. You're a, a genuine desire to learn. I want to know what you know, and then genuinely expressing that desire for me, just once I figured that out, made my life so much easier. Is that everybody is contributing in, in, in some way, shape or form. How does this guy contribute? How do they figure into the organization and a genuine appreciation for what they do? And that takes work on your part because you really have to learn, right? You can't, it's not just about the words. Oh, I really appreciate your contribution to the organization. That, that don't cut it. It's show me how you do that. Explain to me that what you do doesn't make sense to me, but I know that you're an expert at it. So help me understand what it is you understand and, and making that extra effort. So young Pete, then he, he was trying to figure out how to get respect. And what I heard you say is probably gave away a lot of your power. What other looking back, did young Pete do that, that maybe you would have done differently. And again, we're all doing the best we can with what we have. For example, for me as a young leader it was always about me, right? So now I I thought, oh, good, I'm in charge and the team supports me. So I'm in charge. You guys work for me. But to your point, as I've gotten slightly older, I've completely reversed that around. But yeah. what are your thoughts? What else did young Pete have to learn? So young, young Pete was trained too hard to be in charge and that trained hard enough to be responsible. Mm -hmm. And being a leader is about being responsible. You're not, not in charge of things, you're responsible for things. And so when you can make that mental shift, that helps and people see the difference, right? I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm responsible for what happens here or their core. And then the other part is that young Pete wished he was better at was setting expectations. Clear expectations are the most important thing for any subordinate to understand. And we're, all of us are really bad. And that's one of those burpy kind of things. It's always hard. It's what are the expectations and effectively communicating those expectations to your subordinates it is just, or team members, it doesn't necessarily have to be subordinates. It's just critically important. They, they have to understand what the expectations are. And then the other one that I didn't do well enough because it was always not every, and every organization culture is a little different, even within the fire service, but, and I'm a trainer now. That's how I would define myself, but training every day and make having good high fidelity training every day is that young guy telling these old guys, we're going to, we're going to train on this. We're going to work on this. I found that very difficult to do, but it's one of the things I emphatically tell young officers they have to do from day, train your unit, train your company. Every part of every day needs to be about how do we get ourselves better? So even in a corporate environment, how, how are we going to be better today than we were yesterday? Uh, some part of your day has to be devoted to that. And it's the leader's responsibility to, to see that, that happens. Yeah. And, and I think that we, in emergency services, that's, I'm not going to say that's ingrained, but it's expected to do what we call after action reviews and things like that. But yeah. certainly it doesn't have to be anything big and formal, but it could be having a meeting at the end of the day and saying, Hey, you know what, today. We had some challenges in this project or whatever that looked like, I think it is, is easy. And in fact, I have a little poster in the back here that says 1% improvement every day. And then by the end of the year, like that's an exponential improvement. Absolutely. And, and that to your point, it's gotta be part of your culture. 
Yeah, I like the hot wash concept. I don't know if I, if you guys yeah, you use those terms. It's not even the after action yet. It's just immediately when the task is done. How did that go? You know what? Did, what did you do? I I wasn't watching what you were doing over there. What you doing? Everybody just recounts. Okay, this is what we did. This is how the day went, or the operation went. And no explaining. No, but a lot of times spontaneously out of that was yeah, we did this, but next time we and. When the team self-identifies those things, then you're 95% of the way there, right? Now you're after actions, your critiques, you're rewriting stuff, you're you know, trying to improve. It becomes simple because everybody self-identifies. Here's where we felt like we could have made an improvement. Now, does that also mean that the team needs to know what their mission is and, and have that very clearly articulated? That's the expectations part of it. And uh, one of those came late lessons for me, but that I'm a, an absolute, you know, zealot about now is that th the way the firehouse goes, the way the fact the, the way the routine goes is the way the emergency is going to go. And if you think that when the alarm sounds, you're going to get your act together and come together as a group, I got news. For you. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of fire service groups that, that think, oh yeah, we do that. And it's, oh no, you don't. <laughs> You've convinced yourself that you do, but it ain't happening. It's the mastering the details of those routine things. And this is a lesson from the military. This is why they do things the way they do. Those details matter and that cohesiveness around the routine and that paying attention to detail about the, and caring about the routine and how you perform those routines and why that's important to each other. That's what makes the, the, the difficult part of the job come together, right? The emergency scene or however it is. Yeah. And I think too, in, in my experience, it, the saying is, I think something to the effect of how you do the small things is how you do everything. So if you're blowing off the small things, then to expect, particularly during crisis for people to rise up and reach this heroic stage is probably Absolutely. not going to happen. You know, and we do rig checks every day, even though nobody opened that compartment yesterday. So nothing's moved, but we're still going to open the compartment and we're, we're going to check it. And we do, we wash things every day. We clean things every day. And it's not about making them clean really, because they're, they just kept washed yesterday. It's about paying attention to the detail, right? It's about minding the detail, minding the things, um, that, cause those little mistakes, those unnoticeable things are the ones that accumulate. And it's also where you, you start to find respect for one another. We you were talking about this respect thing. And I think sometimes we look for it in the job performance itself. And I just had this recollection. I, I had a guy when I was captain of engine 23, I had a guy who was not exactly well liked by the group and it was just his personality. He was a little abrasive, but in the Chicago fire department, particularly at that time, they would give you all the floor wax you wanted to wax the floors. But after 40 years of wax accumulation, no matter what you did to the floor, it looked like crap, right? This guy, his side job was floor maintenance. He was, he had, was, a, he did floors, right? And so he had all the equipment and the tools and whatever. And the, the short story is I let him come in strip our floors, put high quality wax and then not the crap the city gave us. And our floors in our fire station look like a hospital's floors, quite literally. And so when the chiefs came in to do their, you know, routine inspections and they saw this transformation, it was like. We could have had junk piled up anywhere. The floors just became, oh my God, this, you guys got your act together. Look how beautiful this place is. And in the course of all that, this fella earned some respect, right? With the company, because his contribution now became the thing that everybody knew about. And so he started to have the respect and I started to respect him in the way I didn't respect him before. Cause he wasn't much of a firefighter. He was a pain in the ass to be around. Um, but he, he had something to contribute that really made a difference to how our company, our group was perceived by the larger organization. So he became somebody. And so what role does the leader have? Because I think on every team, well, most teams, there's your high performers and then typically there's your low performer. And I think that's a big challenge for leaders. So how do you address that where there's just one person that's just isn't getting it or they're not well liked from a leadership perspective, that is part of your responsibility to figure out. That actually is your response. That's 
But again, going back to Bruno Insigne again, he, he'd say, what do you call that guy that just comes in barely on time, does what he's told, but nothing more than what he's told, doesn't really perform. What do you call that guy? And we have all kinds of pejoratives for him in the fire service. But what Alan would say is you call him an employee because that's what the majority of employees will do is what, what's expected of them. So part of it is to maybe raise expectations a little. Maybe the problem is not that the employee is underperforming. Maybe the expectations just aren't clear enough or high enough. So that I think the, the, the lesson you learn over time is that it really isn't about them. It's about you, the, the leader, right? If, if somebody's not performing, um, you know, th there is that, okay, we're going to have to get rid of somebody that sort of not performing. So we're not talking about that. We're just saying, isn't quite living up to the rest of the team. You have to put that on yourself. That's my job. That's up to me to figure out how does this guy contribute? And I stumbled in to how, I, and it was Jesse was the guy's name at, at engine 23. I stumbled in to how he could contribute. But once we found a way to get, it just helped everybody. When you figure out how can this person contribute? And what was unique from that experience and the, the lesson it gave me is it had nothing to do with firefight. It had nothing to do with emergency services. It had nothing to do with quote unquote, his job, but it was still a way that he could contribute to the crew because that respect of your superiors is, and not having the chief come in and harass you about how dirty the firehouse is. That made all the difference in the world to how, you know, these guys operate. So they, they all felt better about themselves and about Jesse. And so I think it, it, a lot of it is to reach outside the norm, right? When you have that struggling employee or somebody that you don't feel is being, a, a con, isn't contributing to where they can is look outside the norm. It's not necessarily chapter and verse in terms of, it's not necessarily within their job description. Maybe, maybe they have something to contribute that is different than that. And, and it's, once you find that, then they feel more respected as a person, because it's really not respected as a firefighter or as an employee, people want to be respected as themselves. So look for those opportunities. Don't just look for job related opportunities. In further to that too, I think a lot of leaders, if you're ignoring that and everybody in the room, everyone on the team knows Jesse. And I think if, as a leader, if you're not responsible dealing with Jesse, then couple things happen. One, your respect influence drops. And two, it causes a lot of stress amongst your team saying, look, Jesse, he's just not getting it. But the boss, like w w we can't fix this. What are your thoughts on that? Would you agree? That, that's, that's one of those things is that you better. And I think I was trying to say that with, you're not charged, you're responsible, right? Because that's what the team wants. They, that's what they look to as a leader is to fix that problem. Get that get this guy to be part of the team, either, either make him go away or fix him so that he becomes part of the team. And they look to you as a leader. That's, that's what your average employee assumes is your job is to fix that issue. And if you're not up to that, then you, you're in the wrong part of the organization right now. And, and going into a, a leadership position, you know, or a promotion or whatever, you should understand that that's going to become really what your job is to figure this out. And, and you owe that to those other employees is to find a way to make this guy fit in or fix him or correct them, or if necessary, move him out of the, the group because he's getting in the way of those things. And, and those are those really difficult to ultimately that those are those decisions that determine whether or not you're equipped to be a leader in this organization. Are you willing to, to make those hard ones? And that's a really good segue into decision-making. And one thing that separates emergency services, say, from the corporate environment is the time required to make a decision. But I would also suggest that oftentimes in emergency services, you don't have all of the information and you almost have to embrace the ambiguity, the unknown. So can you speak about how you make decisions when you don't have all the information? Yeah. We call it recognition prime decision making. You and I kind of, or men, there's other variations of that. And it's been studied for a long time. Uh, and it's very different than how uh, most decision makers are taught to make their decisions. And I, I think in a nutshell, it comes down to you learn to make decisions without enough information by making decisions without enough information. Okay. And you have to accept that this is 
and in the fire service, we accept that this is what we're going to have to do. And, and I think for people outside that environment, the best way to communicate this is you don't have to make the best decision. You don't even have to make the, the best decision that you could with the information available. Your decision only has to be good enough. And when you can accept that, then you stop worrying about all of those minutia. And it's not that you're done, right? Because we accept that we're going to make a decision right now. And in another minute or two, we might have to make another decision. And 30 seconds later from that, we might have to reverse that decision. And we become comfortable with that idea is that we're never going to make the best decision. We're going to make one that's good enough for right now, right? It's going to get us to the, it's going to improve this environment by whatever increment we can improve it. And we're going to use that to launch into the next one. And it can be very cumbersome at first, but as you get used to it, as you get used to accepting this idea that I need to make a good enough decision right now, um, then you start getting better at it. And even in the administrative end of it, I found this kind of late in my career was that you don't necessarily have to solve the problem right now. You've got to solve, you got to get through today, right? You got to pull these people away. They're, they're about to rip each other's throats out. You got to make it this much better. And use that as a launching pad to solve your problem. Or and then the other thing too, that goes along with that is committing to constantly evaluate. It's not a one and done, and then we're moving off. But part of your job as a leader is to evaluate, are you actually achieving what you need to achieve? Would you agree? Yeah. And I, I have a great, um, except I can't use it. I can't use the phrase in this environment. You, you mess it up. It's messed up and your job is to unmess it, the word I'm looking for. And then in five minutes, it's going to be messed up. You know, nobody calls 911 and says, I'm having a kind of a off center day. No, I, I kind of, I, this is messed up. Something's come solve my problem. And, and you get there and you unmess it up. And in five minutes, it's going to be messed up again. And your job is to keep unmessing it up until you come to a resolution. And to your point, you have to. Once you get comfortable with that idea that this is just going to be an incremental ongoing good enough until finally I get to best possible and it, and it comes in a sequence of decisions, not in that one wonderful decision. So that takes you, because we all risk that analysis paralysis and we're just going to keep evaluating this and in an emergency scene, you simply cannot. So we get good at that. I don't understand. And so that also speaks to fear and stress that leaders feel. And one of the ways to overcome that is by getting comfortable making those kinds of decisions. So how, what lessons have you learned about managing your own emotions and your stress levels and, and fear? Because as work, our default setting is to fear the unknown and we make things perhaps worse than they really are. So can you speak with your experience, how you manage that over the years? Yeah. Ultimately it's, am I doing the right thing? And we, we all, it, it, as human beings, we know what that is. Am I doing the right thing? Is, is this, if my mother was sitting here, could I, am, am I doing the right thing? It might not be the best thing for this particular situation. Somebody might be able to, to solve this problem better or, or create a better outcome than I could. But, but am I truly trying to accomplish what the right thing to do here is? Can I live with this decision from an ethical, moral and ethical standpoint? And when you start with that, then those difficult decisions become a little easier because again, you're taking off this burden of, I have to make the best decision to, did I make the best possible decision to, did I make one that was good enough for right now? And can that get me to where I need to be? And, and so I think. Go and did you act with good intention, really? Okay. It, it, and truly good intention. And, and we had a good, I, the latter part of my career when I was chief out here in Algonquin and in Lake and the Hills, I had a really good group of guys to work with. The, the union guys were really good. And we, we had some very difficult personnel issues to work through. And we got comfortable reminding each other, let's worry about what's in the contract or what's in the rules and regulations after we decide what's the right thing to do, yeah. right? Not get lost in the minute of what the rules say or what the contract says, and then you get into your little corners and defending the language that somebody else wrote for you. 
if you start with what's the right thing to do here, what does our gut say we want to do here? Okay. All right. Can we get there based on the current set of rules? And, and if we can't, then, then what do we do next? And it just made everybody feel more comfortable about how we were going to solve this problem. We started with, are we doing the right thing? And so in this environment, and I think it's about a misconception that emergency services is all about the person that's in charge. I think that's a kind of an external view of that world. But what I've seen over the years is a decentralized decision-making model be adopted. And I think we're starting to see that mirrored in corporate America, corporate Canada. So what do you tell those leaders, given your experience, that how, how do you manage or allow the people to make the decisions on their own when before we could call a meeting, bring them into the boardroom and I could tell them what to think and what the decision was. But now that's changed. What advice would you give to those individuals that can no longer have that same amount of quote unquote control over their, their you families? Know, you think that, that a large part of that answer is you have to make sure your organization is structured to do that. Because if you don't have that structure, then it, it's hard to make that happen. We, we work in teams of no more than five, right? We want a leader. That's our basic span of control sort of thing. And really, when it gets down to it, we divide firefighters into groups of two and you go off and do that. Well, as soon as you send them off to go do something in groups of two, those two guys got to be making decisions on their own. So the training program and, the, and the, the rules and regulations and the standard operating guidelines are all written with that assumption that very low in the organization, individuals or, or groups, very small groups are going to be making decisions, materially important decisions. You send two paramedics out and the seat, they're literally making life and death decisions on their own. So when you recognize that I'm going to empower them to do this in the nature of things, or, or I'm going to give them the God off the burden of having that responsibility, everything within the organization now has to support that. It has to support that person on the front line that's delivering services to the public. Your responsibility, I shouldn't say, I should only speak for myself. My responsibility was not to the citizens of the community I serve, not really. And it wasn't to my board of trustees. My, my responsibility was to the employees who served those citizens. And if, the, if I can't support them, if they don't know that I absolutely have their back and I will do everything I can to support their mission, then they can't risk everything to support the community. And so Pete, how would you address the fact that when you do that, there is inherently going to be mistakes or failures or whatever. So can you speak about that? Because that's always the push and the pull. People are like, what? I can't have people just out there willy nilly. Yes, you Just, can. <laughs> yeah. And can you speak to that? Yeah. People, again, did, did you give them the guidelines and the training, right? To help them execute the mission. So it's about, it takes you back to clear expectations and, and then, okay, these are the expectations. Do you have all the resources you need to meet those expectations? Do you have all the training you need to meet those expectations? And then do you have a discipline process that I actually think most of the American fire service is good at it, with the whole idea of progressive discipline that truly does understand that people are going to make mistakes. And when they do, you have to hold them accountable, but it's a measured response. It, it, there, there are the exceptions, right? That, you know, thou shalt not cheat, lie, steal, or, you know, tolerate anybody that does, but people are going to make mistakes. They're, they're going to fail. And when they fail, do you support them? Do you have a, a system and process that is truly progressive? and truly does support and, and is trying to get them to become the best employee that they, they can become. And when you can look yourself in the mirror and say, yes, I do that, then all these things fall into place, right? It becomes, and it just becomes a matter of execution, which in itself can be a challenge, fairness across the board and those sorts of things. But without this system in place, which is where the hard work is, right? Without that system in place, the SOGs, the training programs, all that kind of stuff, then you can't push decision-making down into the organization because it, the organization doesn't support it. So you got to make sure you have those processes and systems in place. And then 
take a deep breath and, and wait for it to hit the fan because it's going to, but you'll work through it, right? You, you will work through it. And this takes us back to don't wait for the, the uh, low frequency, high impact event, right? You got to do this on a routine basis. So in other words, in the fire service analogy, it's let the firefighters decide when and how to accomplish their routine duties during the day to the extent possible, right? Don't micromanage during the first hour of work, thou shalt do this. During the second hour of work, thou shalt do that. You let them make those decisions on their own. So long as at the end of the day, all the work has gotten done. Um, and I think it goes full circle back to the respect in that I think when you're empowering your employees and your team, it shows that you respect them and you respect their abilities and so on and so forth. So you're actually going to want to be getting respect back. Do you agree? Yeah. What, what are the uh, phrases that I learned from my military friends was commander's intent, right? It, it's not about the, if you're trying to parse every paragraph in the order, you, you're going to find yourself, the order can't possibly meet every possible contingency. What was the commander's intent? So we have uniform regulations and they, you, during this time you have to wear this and during this time you have to wear that. And there's all kinds of exceptions to those rules. And so I would get this response from the officers, especially as I made some changes. What about this and what about that? I says, look, the order reads that so long as you meet the intent of the uniform order, right? Is, is that you look professional at all times. And here's the guidelines to help you look professional at all times. And you're supposed to be within the guidelines, but if, if you're missing a button or something like that, but you clearly were trying to meet the intent of the order, you're okay. If you're clearly trying to flout the intent of the order, but you're technically in compliance, I'm going to find a way to get shit. It's a, well, we all understand, or we should all understand what the intent of this is. And so when we come to that consensus, then, then we can work through those details of getting to where we want to get to, because we agree on the intent and it, that, yeah. Great. And with the intent, because we spend a lot of time talking about that, but with the intent is what is that end state? What are we trying to achieve? Which kind of goes back into your discussion around expectations. So if we don't give them the end state. How can we hold them accountable for the result? And mission statement. As simple as those things look when you're done with them, if you've ever gone through the process and if you're doing it right, it's a great deal of work. And, and at the end, you come up with this two or three sentence thing and you go, what's the big deal? Anybody could have written it. It's not what you wrote down. It was the process of how you, mm -hmm. you got where the group comes together to understand, okay, this is what we're really all about. And this is how we're going to accomplish our mission. And, and you really have to, to invest some time in it. And then you have to invest some time in, in making sure that the, especially as leaders in the organization, that the decisions you make are consistent with that mission statement and how you develop and, uh, and that also speaks to values and all of those other things, right? right? right. So it's safe to say that this is leadership is, a, is a culmination of so many different cogs and so many different elements and people are a variable that are incredibly unpredictable, particularly when they're under stress. So no wonder leadership's freaking hard. It is hard. It's hard work. I think when that was for me. And it came very late in my career, but that was truly an epiphany is that this is just hard. It's like anything else that was difficult in your life that you decided you wanted to get good at or master or take an attempt at, it's going to involve a lot of work and you've got to be willing to invest the work it, and in sacrifice. You're going to have to perhaps sacrifice some friendships or some closeness or oof, whatever, whatever sacred cows you had, you're, some things are going to have to go. If you truly do want to be an effective leader and the bitch of it is when you took that job, whatever that position was, it came with some leadership responsibility, right? So you might not have been consciously thinking, I want to be a leader, but guess what? You, you took the job, you're cashing the paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> this is what you bought. So invest some time in getting good at it. And it, it really isn't. It's hard. It's not difficult in a sense, right? It, it's hard work, but, but it's not, there, there's plenty of resources there, and it, it clearly, it's about trust. It's about, it, it, they're really simple concepts, but you got to invest the time. I like to think of it as leadership is simple, but it's not easy. Oh yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. 
happening. My, my dad so, told me, hey, we don't have a problem because we know what we're supposed to do. It's going to be gr grueling, brutal, difficult, hard work, but it's not a problem because we know what it is we're supposed to do. You have a problem when you don't know. And I don't think that's the case with leading people. We know what works. We know what we should be doing. And it, and it can often be very difficult work, but it's, it's not a problem. It's not an unsolvable way should perform. Yeah. And so as we close our time off here, Pete, what would you like to tell? Pretty difficult to wrap everything up into one or two lessons, but what would be some advice or some guidance you would give to any leader in an organization? If, if you were to give the one or two sentence Pete's commandments to leadership, what would that be? Surround yourself with really intelligent, hardworking people. And, and I think it's an easy mistake. It, it was easier to do in my career because my job was always secure in the sense that in public service, most places, once you've secured a position, it's really hard to lose it. You have a lot of protections there. In, in corporate environments, it can be very different. You're very at risk. But I think the lesson is still the same. Surround yourself with talented people that can and should be able to do your job. So you can, it, that just really helped. The, the more quality people I surrounded myself with, the easier I found it was to do my job and the things that I thought I was supposed to do and trust them, give them, let them do. This is one of the lessons my dad taught me. He was in the fire service for 40 years too. It, it's let, he would say it this way, let the guys do their work. Don't, so often you're trying to control and stuff like that. No, just every once in a while, you got to reach in and grab them by the belt and pull them back because they're about to hurt themselves or do something stupid or say the wrong thing, whatever it is. But for the most part, let, let people do their work. Give them what they need and let them go. And they'll surprise you in a positive way more often than that if you just give them the chance. Oof, fantastic. Pete, thank you very much for taking the time out of your, out of your quarantine schedule. As we record this, it's three all midnight. We all have time right now. <laughs> That's good. Thank you very much, Thanks, Peter. Peter. And, all right, buddy. Thank you. Good talking with you.